balance. It's something my five-year-old seeks out on nearly a daily basis for the mere thrill of it. As adults, balance seems to become more of a dichotomous relationship between two things, neither of which we can really live without. Intellect versus heart, right versus left, religion versus science. I'm sure looking back on your own life, you can see where you've sought out balance. I can, too. And I found that balancing two seemingly different issues can actually be quite beneficial. Rather than compete with one another, they can strengthen each other. And I found this in my work as well. The last 14 years, I've lived in both Boise and Sun Valley, Idaho, but I've had the opportunity to work all across the state. I've worked on issues like homelessness and recidivism and um, transportation and economic development. And I've had the opportunity to work with all kinds of people, liberals and conservatives, ranchers and executives, nonprofits and government agencies. And as you can imagine, I've seen all kinds of conflicts. Under the surface of those conflicts, however, I found people who seem to have the same goals in mind, a strong economy, a healthy environment, and opportunities for all. It's not the long-term goal they're in conflict about, rather, it's the pathways to achieving them. By bringing together groups and helping them focus on outcomes, we can balance out what is otherwise a contentious and very ineffective situation. You see, balance isn't about a dichotomous relationship. It's about a collaborative one. It's about, not about a relationship where there are winners and losers, but a relationship where knowledge and resources can combine to address a common goal. And I think this is key to solving many of the issues in the world today. Let's look at one issue I've been working on lately, chronic homelessness. Chronically homeless individuals have been without housing for a year or more, and they also have a disabling condition like heart disease or diabetes or long-term substance misuse. For the last year, I've been working on addressing issues related to chronic homelessness in Ada County, Idaho, home to our state's capital, Boise. I went into my work specifically looking at the financial costs that homelessness has on the community, and I was completely blown away completely blown away. There's one individual I met that really stuck out. His name's Joe. Joe's in his mid-40s, and for nearly his entire adult life, Joe has suffered from serious substance misuse, mainly the misuse of alcohol. For the last few years, Joe's also been homeless. Joe certainly has issues related to his, and costs related to his homelessness and substance misuse, but what we found in our research is there are staggering costs to the community as well. In talking with Joe, he shared with me that in order to access alcohol, he would steal hand sanitizer from drugstores, bathrooms, and porta potties. Due to its highly chemical nature, Joe would become violently ill when consuming it, often requiring medical attention. Joe let me look into a six-month period of his life, really dug into it to see what his interactions were with the community. Eleven times, the paramedics were dispatched to assist Joe. We found on at least 13 occasions he went to a local emergency room for help. Because Joe steals the hand sanitizer, trespasses, and is often publicly intoxicated, he had, on multiple occasions, come into contact with the criminal justice system. Again, in that same six months, Joe was arrested 14 times and had 22 charges brought against him. In addition, he spent 95 days in the Ada County Jail. The total community spending on Joe's actions was over $50,000, and that's just in six months' time. What if you had 100 Joes in your community? 100 people experiencing chronic homelessness. Well, that's exactly what Ada County, Idaho was facing. My task was to look at the cost the community was incurring due to those 100 people. I was shocked, completely shocked to find out that on an annual basis, Ada County was spending 
over $5 million to address issues related to chronic homelessness. In speaking with people across the community during my research, I also realized that there are costs that I had a really hard time quantifying. For instance, what are the costs to a private sector business proximate to a homelessness encampment or to panhandling activities? What social costs does the community face when a homeless person dies due to exposure or other incidences? So I was pretty confident that the annual spending on chronic homelessness was at least $5.3 million, but it's really much greater than that. We know it's much greater than that. In my work, I was able to meet with people across all sectors in Ada County, and I came to discover they, they really had one long-term outcome they desired, to end homelessness. But when I spoke with them, that's not the narrative they used. They talked about outputs, like days, in the jail or nights in the emergency shelter instead of focusing on the long-term desired outcome of ending homelessness. The community wasn't coming together to address a common goal. Rather, they were acting in a mindset of scarcity regarding the limited resources available, and they were using those resources to treat the symptoms of homelessness rather than the root causes behind it. The result? Chronic homelessness was on the rise in Ada County rather than the decline. This is just one example. We can see the same story played out across the country. On an annual basis, the U.S. spends upwards of $800 billion on social programs. Yet, we haven't seen much improvement in many social issues since the 1970s. K-12 reading and math achievement rates have remained stagnant, despite a 90% increase in public spending per student. The poverty level has remained at 15%. And we spend billions of dollars a year on chronic disease management, yet 60% of people in the U.S. are obese or overweight. What is going on here? What are we doing? How can we be spending $800 billion a year and not be seeing significant improvements? We are clearly not balancing fiscal responsibility with social well-being, and at this rate, both are suffering. We've probably all heard the old additive, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, it's time for us to just stop quoting this metaphor and actually move forward with it. By balancing the private, public, and nonprofit sector interests, we can fundamentally shift the delivery of social service programs in the U.S. and be more effective and save resources while doing so. There's a new and innovative multi-sector initiative that does just that. It's called Pay for Success. First, a community comes together and they identify an issue, and they also look towards a long-term outcome they desired. Let's use the Ada County uh, example I talked about here. The long-term uh, goal they wanted was to end homelessness, and the issue was, was chronic homelessness. Next, the community works with the facilitator to determine a program that will address that issue. In 2015, Mayor Dave Beter convened a housing and homelessness roundtable group. And with the help of a facilitator, that group selected Housing First as a program that had been proven effective to reduce issues related to chronic homelessness in other communities, like Salt Lake County, Utah. Next, the community looks to a um, someone to do a feasibility assessment to look to see if the program and pay for success will work for them. And this is where my research came in. I needed to look at the current cost the community was spending on chronic homelessness, that $5.3 million, and compare it to the costs that the Housing First program would have. And I found Housing First on an annual operating basis would cost the community about $1.6 million. But I also need to look at the, the, any savings the community would have due to the program. If we put 100 chronically homeless individuals into a Housing First program, we know they'd have less time in the criminal justice, emergency medical, and emergency shelter systems in the community. If they implemented the program, I found the community would save upwards of $2.7 million a year just by implementing the program. Next, the community needs to fund that program, and so they look for contributions and investments to do so. 
In Ada County, they decided to scale their Housing First program to serve 40 chronically homeless individuals. And at that level, they were able to raise all the funding from contributions. If they wanted to scale that program up to serve all chronically homeless individuals, they would likely look to private and philanthropic investors to do so. Finally, the program is implemented. In 2017, experienced nonprofits will launch Housing First in Ada County. An evaluator will track the progress of the program and note the outcomes as well as any costs saved. If the program is deemed successful, the community will likely look to those investors for capital to fund the program. If the scaled-up program is also successful, those investors will actually get paid back their interest, the interest and their capital. If the program is not successful, the investors won't be paid back. Twelve pay-for-success projects have been launched across the country in nine different states. They bring a community together around a common problem, and they address the root causes to social issues like chronic homelessness, recidivism, school readiness, and teenage pregnancy. Pay for Success mandates the balancing of multiple sectors in a way where we all come together to address a common goal. This balance can shift the paradigm of reactive social spending in a way in which we can serve our communities much better in the long run and be more proactive and effective while doing so. By focusing on a common goal, we too can balance. We can balance fiscal responsibility with social well-being, increase our children's literacy, reduce our nation's obesity, decrease the number of people in the criminal justice system, and, yes, end homelessness. Now, these are outcomes we can all get behind. Thank you.